Today is a perfect day to activate one of crypto's phobias. Ugh, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I do not have a fear of Bananas Una. And I am fearful of Bananas Crypto. I had Ooh. no idea. I had no idea. I learned that. I learned that this week, channel. So if you are new to the Codex Cantina, we go through some of the most important literature, even those covering bananas, talking about it in a very <laughs> conversational way. If you're down for that, hit that subscribe button to join us. And as always, we start off publication information. A Perfect Day for Banana Fish was submitted as The Banana Fish in 1947, revised for a year, and eventually published in January 1948 in The New Yorker as A Perfect Day for Banana Fish, later republished in Nine Stories in 1953. Now, I don't think my story with J.D. Salinger is much different from many of you out there. I've only read The Catcher and the Rye before this. Coming into this, you know, we thought, oh, he really likes, you know, loss or PTSD and, and, and this return to innocence. And we see him kind of explore those themes again in this story today. As he was a guy that had been sent to World War II, he was involved in the Battle of the Bulge, and he did go to the hospital for potentially some what used to be called shell shock, and we now refer to as PTSD. He's feeling alienated from everybody else because of his experience in the war and i think that just is a way for him to express himself but also to let other people know that it's okay to have these feelings and we heard about that a lot with the lost generation in terms of ernest hemingway and other writers that were trying to find what does this life mean to me now especially since now i feel so alienated from you know the private citizens who didn't end up uh in war it's kind of an interesting story now from the new yorker i actually have an interesting plot excerpt that i just kind of want to read to you it says, a young man recently returned from the army goes to Florida with his wife. His wife has a telephone conversation with her mother, during which the mother speaks about the young man as though he were mentally deranged, but the girl reassures her that she is not afraid. The husband on the beach goes for a dip in the ocean with a small girl, who is a guest at the hotel. He seems to get along perfectly with the child. When he gets back to his hotel room, where his wife is asleep, he calmly pulls out a gun and shoots himself. I think that's a very, very succinct way to describe this story. Yeah, what's kind of crazy is like that is the story in itself with not much embellishment at all. And <laughs> that's just a summary. It's like, wow, giving it away there, New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting, too, because when you when you open this story up, I think to, to your point about relating to a younger audience, right, some of this is... What's he talking about with, you know, waiting a while to get the call through? And I don't think everybody remembers cord switchboards where you really had operators that plugged in different holes and in cords to, to get calls through. And particularly post-World War, I think this is kind of a callback too about how when things were busy and all the soldiers were returning, there were tons of calls going out. Now, this is allegedly, potentially, I think, taking place in 1948, but I think he's kind of calling up some of those themes that might be a little bit foreign to a newer reader today. I also think, too, that in this part of the story, we really see the disconnect between what a routine life and a life that has gone through some type of traumatic event when trying to return to normalcy. It's almost impossible for you to do, even though it seems mundane, it, it isn't to you when you go into the military. I've never been or served. Thank you for all those people that have, but I, there's a routine, very strict, and that's the way that you survive. That's the way that you win the war. And coming back to this life, that mundaneness is, is not there, and that regulatory life doesn't fit anymore with the hustle bustle of this new American age that I think is taking place in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And this initial opening scene has to deal with trying to communicate and failing to get through, right? And that's something that I think Salinger really explores in his writings from what I've seen, and that's something that we're definitely going to hit on today. Now, the conversation with the mother is something else when it comes to that. <laughs> like they'll ask a question and then the next person that starts to talk doesn't even answer like just completely moves on to a new thread or cuts the other person off these two are in an incredible little snapshot of two individuals that aren't communicating as well even though they finally did get through to each other on the phone this is something that we've kind of talked about before where you're having a conversation and when you're speaking over the phone you don't have all of those micro facial expressions to know a cue if somebody's actually listening to you or not and i think in this case we definitely see where when two people are talking they're hearing each other but they're not actually actively listening to one another 
And I think the point of that is why? Why are they not actively listening to each other? Does it not matter? Do these people not care about one another? Because it's a mother and a daughter. So you figure their relationship would be a little bit better, but it's not. And I think it's setting up the tone of how important relationships are. And even if you are a relative, if you don't communicate well or actively, there's going to be a breakdown of discourse there. I almost, it took me a while as a reader, I got to be honest, to even understand where was the story going, because I thought this was going to be Muriel's story or the mother's story. You know, they're talking about the husband and, you know, is he all right? Is he hurting you? And you're like, what? What's going on? And they talk about like, no, he saw the trees this time. And you're like, wait, so, so he purposely ran into trees in a car? Like, did he try to commit suicide? Like, there's these strange elements in the conversation and, and I kind of had to read the story twice because I didn't realize until I'd read the story all the way through. I'm like, oh, this isn't this isn't Muriel's story. They're, even Muriel is talking about the man, right? Like we're supposed to be talking about Seymour Glass this whole time. And maybe that's part of the theme of communication too, or even just how uh, Salinger decided to convey that was a little confusing for me as a reader on my first pass through. I definitely had to read this twice as well. The first time through, I didn't realize that it was Seymour's story either. I thought that it might be the little girl at some point, but reading back through that second time, you do see the foreshadowing like, oh, the writing kind of was on the wall of, you know, Seymour's mental problems and, you know, his suicidal thoughts and tendencies because it comes out of left field, I think, at the very end there, you know, when when he does kill himself and you're like, wait, what? Oh, yeah. man. Yeah, and I wasn't even sure about the the era, right? Like when I went on my second pass through and, you know, he called her Miss Spiritual Tramp of 1948. And I'm like, spiritual tramp, like, what is, why would he call her that? Like, you know, and in this era, tramp was used as kind of like wanderer or homeless person too, like Lady in the Tramp, right? And I'm like, okay, so this is supposed to date the piece, right? We're, we're in a post-war conversation. He had just been released from the hospital, we learn later on, from like PTSD. And he comes back with this poetry book, even though it's written in what, I think, German, Right signifying that he was in the European battle, right? Just like J.D. Salinger was, Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, And he's definitely. like, he's like, just read, just read this German poem. It's like the best poetry in the world. Just go read, go read that. And, and I think that comes again back to that communication theme of, she's not going to be able to read that. Even if it's written in, in the most elegant and perfect German in the world, she doesn't read German. She won't be able to communicate or hear what that book is trying to communicate, right? Yeah, I think that's one of the key that Salinger's trying to make here is you have this married couple that doesn't communicate at all, and they actually never talk in the story at all. So it's like kind of this, it's hidden behind the scenes that this husband and wife never literally talk inside of this story, a story about communication. And it is interesting, who is the only person that Seymour seems to have a good communication relationship with is this innocent child. Right, right. So jumping into the swimming scene, and I think this is, it, it, depending on where you are, like having read tons from this generation of, of post-war writers, a, a, a very common theme is is being less clothed. In your swim trunks, you're less clothed regularly, right? And, and, and Salinger was very clear about when he would cover himself up with the robe because he was embarrassed of his tattoos, which I don't know if you took it this way, but I was kind of wondering, since we do have the Germany story, is this potentially like he had the concentration camp tattoos or something like that from, from a concentration camp? I'm not sure. And then that's why he has PTSD. But he's clearly trying to cover himself up. And it's only when he kind of is trying to open up with this little girl that he takes you know, his swim clothes off and being less clothes is a symbol of being more open, uh, more, more vulnerable in a sense. And he's talking with this girl, which Salinger, particularly if you've read The Catcher in the Rye, knows he likes to use that as like that return to innocence. So is this a conversation about a post-World War II's vet who's returned to this world, he can't communicate with him, he can't understand what's going on, and he's trying to return to that previous state, that return to innocence, well, like this little child that doesn't know the horrors of this world, and he doesn't know how to maybe even return to that. I think with the tattoo, to kind of circle back to that, kind of goes back to his psychological stresses, and the mother even points out that he might be lying about it. We don't know if he has the tattoo or not, 
uh, and, and or maybe have that tattoo and have it removed. But, you know, the psychological trauma of someone numbering you like an animal has just made its imprint on him, whether he can see the ink or not anymore at all. Uh, you know, battle scars aren't just physical. And, you know, that that is something that I think leads back to that. But I think that, yeah, I think that Sybil has a, a specific language that he's able to tap into, you know, his innocence of pre-war and they're able to talk to one another. I was a little worried about this part of the story because I thought it was going to take a dark turn of like, oh my, is he going to do something horrible to this child? And I think he's just trying to create a bond with some other person to try to have some sense of normalcy in his life. Yeah, it's interesting because he's trying to communicate with her, right? And if you remember, what color was her swimsuit? Blue. It was yellow. It was yellow. <laughs> no, because bananas are yellow, and I don't want to think about them. <laughs> well, what's interesting is he couldn't see the color of her suit. Like he's like, it's blue, right? He, she had to come. Yeah, close he and said show it's him. light blue. Well, and interestingly enough, his trunks were blue. Right, so he should know what blue is. I don't think this is a colorblind conversation. He's no, not un- at all. He's unable to communicate with innocence, in a sense, in this picture too. And even then, the little girl like talked about how she would like poke dogs. Was was it she was saying she poked dogs with a stick? There was something about that perversion of innocence, and and even little kids understanding what's right and wrong. I think, uh, as opposed to the war, where it's just kind of senseless violence. I think a lot of authors tend to write to. Yeah. Oh, oh, I got one for you. Let's go real deep down that rabbit hole. Crazy. Blue. And yellow, make what color? Oh, I'm terrible at this. What is it? Green. Yeah. What color does the army wear? <gasps> oh, <No. laughs> interesting. That's that's definitely out there. I like it. I like uh, it. Yeah, I'm, just out there. No. That's out there. I, I just I, 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 I try to look color. for the colors because I know you love the flowers <laughs> no, and the colors. I do, love, I do love me some color analysis. <laughs> um, but but one thing you mentioned, you said language earlier, and that's clearly something that Salinger's playing with as well here, where the little girl says Seymour Glass, like his name Seymour, the first name, and then Glass. But the mom hears see, like, don't you see visually more, you know, an additional glass, like the material glass. And I think this is part of Salinger's play of transparency, right? Yeah. In terms of when he comes back from this war, how did, how, because you got to remember during World War II, there was a ton of propaganda, a ton of, of narrative put behind total war, right? Sending the whole country to war. We're all in this together, right? And he saw things. That, that none of the private citizens that didn't go to war didn't. And it changed him clearly, right? He had just been released from the hospital. So I can't help but imagine that glass, that transparency, has to be a play on words from language from Salinger as well in this part of the story. Oh, for sure. I think, too, that he's trying to talk a little bit about the hustle and bustle of the materialistic view, especially with, like, the mother and that she is not transparent and that all she cares about is materialistic possessions. Consumerism has consumed her life and he has seen the toils of life and death at its worst and at its best and these tragedies and maybe heroic events. And he's like, what do I care if I have the newest telephone? What do I care if, you know, I have the newest, you know, fanciest dinner tie or whatever? Like those things are pointless mm. to him, a trivial to him, and that's all that matters to his wife and his mother-in-law, and he just can't connect with them on that level because he has seen things that are vastly more important than that ever-looming American consumerism that has kind of started to plague our society in the late 1940s. All right, we need to talk about it. What's a banana fish? I don't think there's such thing as a fish that is referred to as a banana. Maybe there is. I don't know that much about fish, but I think that this post-war boom of U.S. society, I think that the shell shock and PTSD doesn't isn't understood yet. I think banana fish is tragedy for Seymour Glass, and I think that he's trying to fill his life with something with meaning. And in the story, the the banana fish get fat and get stuck in their holes, and he's fat with tragedy or loss. And he can't get out of that rut to get back to life. And ultimately, he takes his life like the banana fish do, unintentionally, I think. You mentioned earlier there was a sense of dread. And and I don't know where your sense of dread was, but there was also he took Sybil's foot and then gave it a little bit of a kiss before pushing her off, right? 
Did you, what did you think about that scene? I think that was his last saying goodbye to his final shred of humanity that he knew that he couldn't fit back into a normal society. And I, I can't have this. Uh, I wish you luck, you know, young lady and your endeavors. I think it was a, I think it was a goodbye to himself more than it was to her. Do you think it, you said goodbye. Uh, is this a redemption moment? No, because I think that if he had truly felt redeemed, he would have tried to continue on living because living is hard. Dying is easy, as I don't know that personally, obviously. Uh, I, or maybe he sees it reverse, that, that you know, living is easy and dying is hard. I, I've never been in a World War II combat situation like Seymour or Salinger, so I don't think it's redemption, though. Interestingly enough, that is a common symbol in, in Christianity, a kissing of the feet of redemption. And here he is saying goodbye to to innocence, right? Moving on to what is ultimately violence, right? Choosing choosing violence over the, the passivity is clearly something that is happening in this moment because he goes back, he sees his wife. Does To your point, he doesn't communicate with her. At no point do they ever exchange any words that we see as, as the reader or that's expressed to us from the narrator, right? And kills himself. Yeah. I... It's it's it, it it's kind of a conundrum here at the end because you feel like okay he's he's done it he's overcome at least some hurdle in his life and things are going to get better and he's just decided nope it's never going to get better than this I'm never going to be like that child again and I don't want to not be like that yeah you know I think you said it it seems weird that we have to disclaim, hey, you know, we've never been in a world war. It's World War II. It's obvious, right? Everyone from that generation is significantly older than you and I. This is a generation gone. Not to say that people haven't experienced tragedy. Not to say that people can't expect PSTD. PSTD but the idea of total war, the idea of returning home and life uh, just feeling so different, not that it can't exist in a one-off situation, but this is a story that doesn't happen as much anymore. And I, I, it's interesting what literature can do. And I'm reading this story and just all I see is how this man wants to go back to innocence. Maybe that's my catcher in the rye syndrome. And, uh, you know, he's pushing it off at the end. You know, he kisses it goodbye and he goes in to the house and much like the banana fish that go in to die, they know they're going to die. They just try to get as much as they can before it happens. You know, he goes into his home or maybe maybe that's a whole arguably comparable to that and um you know kills himself he, he gives up on that dream of ever returning to that state of of comfort and or even being able to communicate and we know he was already considering it or at least i think we do because i think that's what that whole he saw the trees this time commentary was like i think he tried to kill himself by running his car into the trees at some point uh earlier so and, yeah. and and the mother gave all these hints too. Is he dangerous? Are you okay? Like like no, mom. Is he I'm acting not, crazy again? Yeah, I remember she I'm says not that scared too. of him, right? But like obviously the mom can tell that he was violent and he was trying to escape or solve his problem, and she didn't know how he would do it. And uh, unfortunately, you know, suicide was the answer for this man. And I think it's kind of it's kind of a sad story to tell that uh, really I think encapsulates a generation story that we aren't familiar with. Yeah, I think this is something that hits the nail on the head for what it was like for tens of thousands of young men that had to grow up far beyond their years in, when they were forced into the draft at 18 and went and saw the worst of humanity and possibly the best of humanity in small doses and then having to try to come back to a sense of life that was beyond them anymore. And so not having a life was a better choice. And that is just heartbreaking for what they'd already sacrificed to then give up the ultimate sacrifice once they'd won and give up their life is, is truly heartbreaking to me anyway. Another American writer that was in the same situation, Kurt Vonnegut, do you know what he called? Do you know what he called it? He called it the children's crusade. And I think, oh, I think, yeah, yeah, you told me that before. Yeah. Salinger, Salinger is an interesting writer. I don't really know much about him, but. Fun little history fact here. So, the type of gun that he wrote into the story, and I don't know how to say it because it's German, the Odtigris or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
uh, that gun was the same gun that Hitler gave to Ava Braun as a wedding gift, you know, the couple of days before they committed dual suicide. Oh. Kind of crazy, right? Oh, interesting. <laughs> that he picked yeah. that gun. Well, it's yeah. probably it was probably meant to be foreshadowing, right? Yeah, I think so, too. Okay. Okay, interesting. Once you saw that that specific gun, if you're a history buff and you knew Salinger, you'd be like, oh, that's the gun that Hitler gave Ava. That that says something right there that death is looming because they yeah. both committed suicide. Well, all right, guys. If you are looking for more Salinger talks, if we have any, they'll be in a playlist down below. For now, let's move into our subjective ratings, which shouldn't mean anything to you. It's not an objective of, of this is the value of this story, but just how did it hit us as readers? Crypto, what are you going to give this one? On this one, I think that I'm going to give it a solid eight. Uh, I had to read it twice, and that definitely says something that, you know, you have to read a story more than once. You may need to get deeper into it to understand more, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think there's a couple of good themes here that we've already discussed. Uh, all around, I think it was a pretty solid story. Uh, obviously, very heartbreaking. I probably should give it a one because it has my phobia in it, but because <laughs> there's no true B words in it. Uh, it was, you know, a metaphor of a weird, funny fish. I'm okay with it. So <laughs> what about you? I'll give it maybe like a seven out of 10. I will say I, I had the same experience where I had to read it twice, which is usually more rewarding for me, but, uh, something just felt, and maybe that's okay, but it felt unsettling and it's okay to feel unsettled as a reader. But for some reason, the, the way it was resolved, you know, just the, the lessons or, or who got, who, who learned the lesson is the one that ended it. I just, yeah, just didn't feel really rewarding to me, but uh, appreciate, you know, appreciate clearly how he wove a very tragic story here together. So. All right, guys. Well, with that said, we post videos every Monday and Thursday. If you're down for literature discussions like that, make sure you hit that subscribe button to join us. Peace. Crypto out. <laughs>